there isn't that belief in the Enlightenment, the dominance of truth and freedom is not there as anywhere near as much. Now, I will say there is a very big split on gender lines in this younger generation. So male, female amongst that younger group on these woke questions, it can be as much as 50 points apart. So there's a big gender aspect to this. What, so the men are more... Uh... A lot less woke. Uh, young men are a lot less woke than young women. For the wrong to rule, the good must just stand idly by. Hello, happy Sunday. I've got cold, or maybe I've got Omicron, Omnicon, whichever one it is. Anyway, uh, you know the culture wars, those things that apparently don't exist? Well, they do, as we know on this channel, and we like to talk about them. So I am very lucky to be joined by Eric Kaufman, author of two recent reports for the Policy Exchange on the culture wars. Uh, Eric, thank you for coming. How are you doing? Great to be here. Doing, doing very well, thanks. Good. Um, I was looking through, I came across this because of a Twitter thread that I saw of you posting polling about kids and, uh, well, intergenerational attitudes towards um, cultural stuff. So can you tell me a bit about um, the reports themselves? Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, the first thing to note is that, you know, you will get people, particularly on the left, who say this is a right-wing moral panic. Yeah, there may be the odd school, like the American School in London, that has this stuff, but really, we're not teaching this. Critical race theory is not being taught. Uh, actually, what this survey, which is a representative draw from uh, 18 to 20-year-olds in this country, we asked them what they were taught at school. Turns out, uh, six in 10 of them were taught concepts from critical race theory. So one of white privilege, systemic racism, or unconscious bias. And if we add a couple of gender concepts, patriarchy and the idea of many genders, it's up to 73%. Um, not only that, it's actually rising as you go down the age range. So 18-year-olds, it's 78%. Whereas the sort of 20-year-olds who were in school three years ago, it's lower. It's like 65 or something. So it's still rising, and it's the majority. And so this is not something that's just a few isolated incidents. Yes, yeah, so people would just have you convinced, people would have you convinced it's an isolated incident, but it's yeah. not. It's getting worse. But it's not, I've not met any member of the public who likes any of this stuff. So where's the disparity there? Yeah, I, and indeed, I mean, you can see in our reports, we polled the public, and it's something like 70% against most of these things and 30% in favor. Um, and so, yeah, the public's against this, but they're not aware of the extent to which, because even as a parent, I mean, I wasn't really aware of all the, the teaching materials that are used, and those things aren't necessarily released to parents anyway. So Not unless you ask for them. No, and even if you do ask for them, they might refuse you. They don't, they don't actually have to give them to you, which is something that needs changing. We are changing it. The Bad Law Project's changing that. We're, uh, we I, are getting around the GDPR issue that they're oh. trying to claim is a problem for them. So we have uh, children being indoctrinated in schools with the idea of critical race theory, which essentially is, um, you know, how does one break critical race theory down really easily, which is just racism to replace bad, race, uh, good well, racism. Well, yeah, it's basically like any disparity uh, between racial groups on income can only be explained as a result of racism. And if you can't find the racist, then it must just be this loose amorphous structure which you can't see, you can't measure, you can't test, but, you know, trust me, it's there. It's systemic. Uh, it's, it's like the matrix. You know, if you're in it, it's affecting you, you just don't know it. Yeah. Uh, but there's no way of proving it. Uh, yeah, so this, this kind of zombie theory is, is really what's being pushed. Now, these concepts, of course, what some people will say is, well, well this is not actually critical race theory because it's not the high theorists like Derek Bell or, or Kimberly Crenshaw, but actually the reality is these concepts are derivative of the same theory, that, that there can be racism without actual racists, is kind of the argument. Uh, yeah, sort of ghost hunting. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's bonkers. Yeah. But it's, um, to be cynical about it, the reason why it's getting younger and re younger and younger is because kids' minds are much easier to manipulate and they're, they're malleable, they're thinking, aren't they? So if you can get these Marxist ideas into their heads young, you can change the entire generation. But well, yeah. I mean, and I think they're getting a lot of it from social media and celebrities and all that stuff. Yeah, so why, that's the main... Why are celebrities into all of this stuff? Well, because it's the sort of, that's the highest value in the culture. It's something that's been building for, <coughs> since the 1960s. So it's ascendant in the culture. So they just want to be with what are the most highest prestige values uh, in the society. What, without thinking? 
yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's well, always celebrities and artists are meant to think. Yeah, they're meant to be the thing that holds the mirror up to nature and go, look at the world you live in. It's not, you know, this is where the lies are and all that sort of stuff. But actually, they're just they are the culture. They're not countercultural at all. Celebrities yeah. and these ki these kids think that this is radical revolutionary stuff. It's just boring, monotonous indoctrination of children. Yeah, well, but they managed to sort of preserve this frame like we were back in the 1920s where the establishment is somehow conservative and nationalist and whatever and we're the, the true rebels. The reality, of course, as you know, is that the establishment are, in fact, the people with these what I call cultural socialist or woke values. They dominate, and so, but people are kind of deluded into thinking they're fighting the establishment when they are the establishment. Like um, China, then. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean... So, so it is. It is remarkable how many have kind of fallen for this. It's all around this idea that that these two moral foundations of being caring for the oppressed and also pushing for equality for the oppressed is is, is those it values are dominant. Or, or equity. Well, equity in the sense of equal outcomes, right? which is really dangerous. Yeah. On a bureaucratic level, it's really dangerous because how do you create equity without making a lot of people without jobs other than to secure equity? Yeah, well, you need to use power and institutional power to crush dissent in order to ensure equity, right? So, so if you want, if people aren't naturally having equal outcomes by race, whether it be on the basketball court or in academia, well, you have to engineer it. Not on the basketball court. But, well, no, it is on the basketball court. It's 100% on the basketball court because, you know, yeah, as Ben Shapiro quite frequently points out, he mm. wouldn't have a chance in the NBA. Right. Where's his chance in the NBA? You know, it, um, so w my theory, or what I have sort of gathered um, from reading, and you can tell me whether it's rubbish because it probably <laughs> right. is, um, is that a lot of this stuff comes out uh, of affirmative action in the first place, which is the only racist laws ever that I can actually see in the West. And that what was happening was they were, you know, as part of this equity drive, they were getting uh, ethnic minority students in American universities and affecting their SAT scores so that they could get into certain universities. Am I correct so far? Yes, essentially, yeah. You can get in with a much lower SAT if you are black or Hispanic in the Ivy League, yeah. So then, the, you, these, uh, and this is at no point am I saying that black students and Latino students and white students and Asian students are any cleverer than each other, but by manipulating these scores, you, would, you were having uh, less people that weren't capable, academically capable, of fulfilling their potential within the courses that they were on, and they were flunking out of their courses, they were dropping out their courses. And then the universities had to go, well, why are they falling out of their courses? So then they invented um, courses about why that they were falling out of courses. Right, Is that, <laughs> right, right, okay. That's sort, yeah, of what, yeah. that's sort of what Heather MacDonald says in the right. diversity delusion. And I think it actually makes some sense. So gender studies and stuff comes out of the fact there aren't enough women in STEM. And, um, you know, critical race uh, things and, and uh, black studies and things like that come out of the fact that, you know, the, the whole white supremacist structure of university is why they can't <laughs> right. succeed. So yeah. Is well, it, it all, yeah, you're right. I mean, that, that chronology is pretty good, right? And it all stems from this idea that any differences between groups, particularly where historically disadvantaged groups score lower or, or are earning less, are, can only be explained by racism. Rather than, like Thomas Sowell would say, look, this isn't about genetics, but it's about culture, and that you've got to actually focus on culture. Or if you take a poor group, a country, group, pe group of people from Tanzania, if they showed up from the poorest country in the world, of course they're going to be poorer in Britain than other people because that's their migration history. But mm. yeah, none of these complicating factors that actually explain uh, these differences are allowable. The only one that is allowable is that it's something about power differential. And, and that's where this sort of critical race theory comes in. And so the power differential has got, got nothing to do with race, though. It's to do with Marxism and, and, as you say, and the equity drive, which is to take, is to re destroy the meritocracy, drag right. everybody down to the lowest common denominator, is that, which essentially is communism, isn't it? Right, yeah. So that's, that's kind of why I say cultural socialism. It's taking the oppressor-oppressor worldview that was applied to class and applying it to identity. It's taking the redistribution idea that was applied to the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and, and, and transposing that onto racial groups. So any disparity, you must engineer it out of the system through affirmative action, ex discrimination, et cetera. So yeah, that is essentially what's occurred. But it's also the other part of this, of course, is 
uh, hypersensitivity, that, that wasn't there in Marxism as much, this idea that you didn't want to offend uh, the oppressed group. But now that's been sort of, with a therapeutic uh, revolution in the sort of 70s, 80s, what we've now got is anything that offends the most sensitive member of one of these historically marginalized groups, so so-called microaggressions, like saying anyone can make it in Britain, um, that yeah. then becomes a taboo. And so you actually trip over the accusation of being a racist just for saying something like that. Well, it's kind of a, it's, a, it's a clever idea because ultimately it's better than doing it by force, isn't it? By actually forcing someone. So you just go, I'm offended, therefore you, I suppress your right to dissent and disagree with me because yeah. you offend me and therefore we have to maintain this myopic kind of monocultural view of, yeah. of oppression. But why race? Why race ahead of, of class when we are right. looking at a massive class disparities uh, across the West? Well, okay, so I think you've got to go back to the beginning. Uh, I don't know if you've come across Shelby Steele. I love Shelby Steele. Okay, Steel. so the book White Guilt, I think, does a good job of explaining what happened. So he sort of says, you know, you, it used to be the case that black people deferred to white people in colonialism or in the Deep South or whatever. Uh, so the whites had the moral authority. And then after the Civil Rights Movement, the, you know, the whites admitted that they did wrong, and suddenly the moral authority went to, the, to black Americans and away from white Americans and all of American institutions lost their moral authority. So they had to go out of their way to virtue signal that, that they were anti-racist by adopting affirmative action programs and other things which Steele said were never designed to actually fix any problem. They were just designed to signal. Um, and so that then, now why race? That's a good question. So I think part of the explanation is... You can't change it. Well, no, but I think... If you take the left, I mean, Marxists were getting disillusioned with the white working class in the 60s. And then you had decolonization and black radicalism and the Black Panthers, and they saw this energy and they thought, actually, we need to pivot to them and the students. That's who's kind of the avant-garde of the revolution now. And so Marcuse and all these people kind of, and, uh, you know, free air, not, not free air, but I'm trying to think of um, Fanon, and Jean-Paul Sartre and these people kind of moved to third world socialism and away from traditional Marxist socialism. And so there's, they're starting to move to identity. And they start with race, and then, it, and then it becomes radical feminism, and then it's sort of the LGBT movement riffing off of that. And all these so-called new social movements emerge based on the paradigm of identity politics. Uh, but I think this is really because the left was looking for a new paradigm after the Marxist one was kind of failing. And as we've entered, uh, as the world has become more, uh, as certainly as the West has become more and more equal, the, the low-hanging fruit are gone. So you've got, to in, you've got to try and reach further up the tree for even crazier, madder stuff. So you end up with immutability and stuff yeah. like that. So you attack someone based on, and judge them on immutability, which is racism. Right. That's, that's what it is. And we have in this, certainly in England, that never gets reported by anybody, you know, a real problem with white working class kids, but they, you're not allowed to discuss them. It's, it's not allowed to be at all. Yeah, Straight. or the fact that they're disproportionate, well, they're underrepresented at university, right? So there'll be all this focus on the awarding gap in terms of A stars between, say, white and black or white and minority, but no attention to the entrance gap between, you know, where minorities are doing a lot better than whites. So it's very selective in terms of which gaps uh, they're interested in because it's all about the narrative of victimhood points and whoever's highest on that victimhood totem pole is going to get the, the, the attention. Um, but yeah. Jordan Reed made, made a good point about this anyway. He said, because it's such a badly thought through idea wokery and all of this intersectional mm. stuff that if you intersect enough and enough and enough into victim groups you end up with an individual anyway so <laughs> right do you right. know what i mean so <laughs> yeah i guess yeah, that's true but they're not interested in certain kinds of victims so someone who's on the spectrum or who has a low iq or who is unattractive or none of those things really matter really. Um, so it's only certain ones that are politicized, and that's mainly the social group ones around race, gender, and sexuality. Um, so you know, class is another one, coming from a, or, or perhaps um, coming from a family with only a single mother versus two parents. All, all these things which matter hugely yeah. are not really politicized, or they're not treated as 
of the same importance, really, as immutable characteristics. So, yeah. so we've we've stopped using society positively to 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 try and <laughs> you know use the lessons that we've learned throughout history positively, and we've just gone off on this complete tangent, which is ripping society apart, put politics into everything. So nothing mm. is not politicized. As you say, schools, I did write to my school and I have got the lesson plans and they do teach uh, white privilege and they teach gender ideology and they do, so they're teaching 10 year olds this stuff. Right. So, you know, but you say, it. I was interviewing someone this morning and they said, no, no, it's not, it's very uncommon that this happens. Yeah. And it's like, no, it's really common. And um, we need, what's so great about what you've done is you've gone, this is, here we are, here are your facts, guys. Exactly, yeah, I, and this is the thing, I just thought it needed some sort of social scientific evidence base, right? Otherwise it's just, they picked an anecdote, I picked an anecdote, but here it is, we've got the representative sample and it's a majority, right? It's not just a few. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think this is, and, and part of this is, you know, the curriculum is set by government. You know, there have been periods in, like I'm from Canada, there was a period where you had a conservative government in Ontario, they changed the curriculum so all the kids would learn about the excesses of communism, for example. I mean, you could do that. Or you could say, okay, we're, we can learn about slavery, but we're also going to learn about the Arab slave trade. We're going to learn about the, the Aztecs and yeah. what people were doing in these colonies before they were colonized. Um, that would actually give you a more rounded picture, so it wouldn't be so sort of slanted. Uh, yeah. Well, in, in my theory of, another theory of my life, which I operate <laughs> on and is yet to be disproved, which is they are the exact thing they accuse you of, um, the left, the hard left anyway, is um, this idea of decolonization. We are trying to recolonize the world with wokery. That's what we're trying to do, isn't it? We're trying it's to interesting, take, yeah. We are trying to take our values or values to Qatar to go and sit there and go, we're on our knees against inclusivity, you little Qatari people. Which is really, I mean, I don't agree with the Qatari approach mm. to uh, gay and lesbian people, but it's not my country. So I don't get to choose. We're trying to colonize them with our views. So yeah. essentially, while they say decolonize the curriculum and decolonize this and your terrible colonial past, they're just starting up a new colonial um, existence, right. aren't they? Do you think? That is interesting. I mean, I guess it depends what you, you know, I mean, this word colonial is so overused, right? I mean, the, uh, you know, one of the questions, I, I think, you know, you can always advocate for your values. I and mean, yes, I would like to see procedural liberalism in Qatar, but the bigger issue is, you know, what do you mean? Like, so I'm an academic and we've got these endless, uh, you know, initiatives to decolonize the curriculum, right? Yeah. So to introduce, you know, race and gender diversity and then, um, but of course the question is, well, they never actually show you how it was colonized. It was just, well, there's a lot of whites and males on there. It must mean that, therefore, it was colonized. Well, the next logical question is, is this a Judaized curriculum, and therefore we need some Jewish quotas, right? Because Jews are heavily overrepresented on, on most reading lists. It's certainly on the reading list I use, they're enormously overrepresented. Uh, so what are you going to do about that? Well, is it, of course, that's dis uncomfortable territory for them. Yeah. But it's the same logic. So are you saying the curriculum was Judaized at some point? You know, I mean, it's crazy. And that's what Hitler was doing. He was sort of saying, oh, there's too many Jews in this field and that field. And, and you know, it's the same logic. It's exactly the yeah. same logic, isn't it? So does it, but does it have, you know, we've seen in the last couple of years how easily you can spin a culture on its head and make people do things they would never ever do before. Do you think this this movement has a malevolent intent to it? Well, I don't even know that it's coordinated like that. It's just, I think it's more like a mind virus, like Gad said yeah, says, yeah. you know, it's just like COVID and it spreads and then you, you get it and you become a spreader and there are some super spreaders and then eventually they'll take over an institution or two and make their way towards government as in Scotland or Canada. Um, so I think it's more that than it is any nefarious plot to, to take over the institute, march through the institute. I don't think there was actually any overt plot that was followed. But it's just one of these things, like if you think that the highest moral virtue is to be super, super, super sensitive to uh, historically marginalized race, gender, and sexual identity groups, and that, then that trumps everything, including scientific reason and free speech. And then, and that's quite compelling. You then drag in the stories you know, slavery, colonialism, uh, genocide, etc., Holocaust. But it's ongoing. This yeah. is, all this stuff is ongoing. It so, is. So, so what? It, it, it is just pure virtue signaling. It's not real. 
because you can, what are there, 40, 50 million slaves living today? Yes, yeah, yeah. You've got um, internment camps for Uyghur Muslims in China. We, you've right. got it all. And you've got LeBron James who won't criticize anything to do with China, but he's woke. Right. I don't, I'm, I'm confused as to what the, where this thing is, when this thing, I agree with you that there's an incompetence to it. It's not, right. it's not totally Klaus Schwab. Trying right, to turn okay. the world, world into right. a thing because they're they're not smart enough most of the time these right. these people. But um, <laughs> where's it heading? Well, where it's heading, I'm afraid, is that this idea that you know, oh, you have people say, oh, wokeness is peak because we've got editorial in the New York Times and the Economist and Harper's, and okay, nothing to worry about. And one of the things I say in my report is, just look at the age split on these questions. Um, you know, and, and for example, more people under age 25 would like to see, uh, you know, would like the vice chancellor of Sussex University not to have defended Kathleen Stock free speech rights than supported the VC backing her. Or more, you know, it's roughly 50-50 between those who say J.K. Rowling should be dropped by her publisher or should not be dropped by her publisher amongst this age group, whereas the 50 plus, it's like 85 to 5 against the woke position. So the generational split is massive, especially amongst the left. So the older left is actually pretty tolerant. Yeah. And, you know, they'd be pretty in favor of Stock being allowed to speak and Rowling being allowed to write. And because they, they believed, that the, the traditional left believed in the, the fact that the working man or the working woman who had fuck all, to be honest, right. needed free speech to be able to get their point across. That would have been a traditional left-wing position, but it's gone. Yeah, yeah so, it, but the, so it's really on the left that you see this big age gap. The young left is really intolerant, really absolutist, and, and in fact, there's even surveys in the U.S. that go back to the 70s where you can track this intolerance amongst sort of students. Uh, and it's the same age. So 18-year-old in 1970, 1990, 2010, you can see that same individual is becoming a lot less tolerant of certain kinds of speech. Not, not other kinds of speech, but certainly anything around the identity topics. Much more absolutist, much less relativist. Um, yeah. that's, and that's dangerous. Yeah, so there, there isn't that belief in the Enlightenment. The dominance of truth and freedom is not there as anywhere near as much. Now, I will say there is a very big split on gender lines in this younger generation. So male, female amongst that younger group on these woke questions, it can be as much as 50 points apart. So there's a big gender aspect to this. What, so the m men are more... Uh... A lot less woke. Uh, young men are a lot less woke than young women. Oh, well, that's a shame, yeah. being, a yeah. straight, being a straight bloke. <laughs> oh. oh, no. <laughs> so forget about it, Lawrence. <laughs> oh, no. Is it going to what? So why are women more susceptible, would you say, to, to it? Is it? Because yeah. women are naturally more, yeah, what, uh, what's that other great Jordan Peterson thing? Trait, um, <laughs> you always talked about personality traits. Agreeable? Agreeable. Agreeable, yeah. That's the one. Yeah, I think that's part of it. But I think the other thing is, you know, in 1970, women, uh, female students were more conservative than male students, right? And so it's, it's, they'll fall in behind whatever the orthodox dominant value system is. And so they're just falling behind what is the dominant value system in the world they live in. But um, why are they falling, but why, 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 are they, why are they more woke when woke is anti-female? Well, no, well, not only are they more woke, but they are, for example, women are more in favor of trans people gaining access to women's shelters than they are. men are. They are. So they are actually more pro-trans than men in the survey data because they've been taught to be caring and they're the ones who sort of uphold whatever the community norms are. And those are the community norms right now. They also don't yeah. know what men are like then <laughs> well, either because I'm really so, sorry. Any man who wants to hang around a woman's changing room or go to the loo in a woman's bathroom. <laughs> we've all met a bloke like that, <laughs> haven't we? And that's not to criticize your, you know, a, mm. a, absolute transgender people who do exist, but we've seen an explosion in this. And then you see what's happened in the American universities with the, and the high school where that, the, where was it? Mm. The, the rape in the, in the bathroom. Oh, yes, that, yeah. Where was that? In Virginia, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Forgive um, me, my cold is killing me. I um, know. <clears throat> so... Where do we need to go? Where do we need to go now in this conversation? I mean, well, well, I'm I'm kind of quite a big proponent of of government intervention. Okay, and, right. And I, mean, and I know that you know some libertarians don't like that, but my view on it is, 
you, you can't be a libertarian, you know, the libertarian on this issue just means you're handing the woke the victory, right? Because they control the institutions, um, they're quite universities, organizations, publishing, movies, whatever. Um, so all the institutions are controlled, right? You, the only institution that the anti-woke side has a chance of controlling is elected government some of the time, or most of the time. And so they've got to use that leverage. Or not at the moment. Or I not mean, at the moment. We've had right. a palace coup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in Britain, no, but yeah. in the U.S. in certain states like Florida, yes. Um, and so you need to actually have the government come in and issue very, very detailed guidance to schools, uh, to the civil service. It's like This is political. You have to be politically impartial. So that's already in the law in Britain. Schools cannot indoctrinate. They have to be politically neutral, but they're not. No. So the, the, what you need to do is two things. One is you need an enforcement mechanism. Uh, two, you need to, to write the guidance that says, actually, this is what political impartiality is. Anti-racism is not, you know, anti-racism is a common value, but it excludes systemic racism. That's got to be written down so mm. that whenever teachers drag this out, right now what they're doing is they're saying, oh, we're just teaching anti-racism, which is a consensus value. It's not political. But the is problem is they're, well, they're smuggling in this critical race theory into the definition of, you know, so yeah, we'd all agree not to teach uh, racial slurs, but the, the stuff that we would think of as racism, but what they're thinking of is, well, no, racism also means teaching that Britain is a systemically racist country. That's, that's just part of our anti-racism. So you've actually got to drill down and specify that that is political and not consensual. And then once they break that, you've got them. But right now you don't have them because they'll just say, oh, no, no, we're just teaching anti-racism. But they're clever with anti-racism because the problem with anti-racism is that there's an opposite to it, which is racist. Whereas there is no opposite to not racist, is there? So if you, if right. you can condemn racism, I mean, I'm, I imagine that's part of every school's policy, but to be actively anti-racist is to find racism everywhere and try and remove it. And if you don't remove it, you are a racist. That's the, my problem with anti-racism. I'm going to a talk next week at my son's school about anti-racism. Oh, and how do, I talk, how, do I talk, <laughs> how do I talk to my ch child about race? These are rich white liberals, all of them. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's just crazy. Uh, it all seems to come out of that same, it, that, that same thing. Um, so government intervention would be, in education, would be a, we're not going to teach this, we're not going to teach... We're going to teach that racism in its Oxford English Dictionary right. version. Which or is the old, maybe, maybe yeah. a few years back Oxford English Dictionary, yeah. Definitely not the Merriam-Webster version. Yes. But it's to teach that discriminating against someone based on their ethnicity or skin colour is racism. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. one thing. I mean, ideally you would also have guidance on there to try and decenter the conversation away from just race, sex, gender to other things other kinds of, you know, uh, disability, IQ, or uh, maybe not IQ, that's tricky, but... Well, I think IQ, weirdly, is probably a bit systemically racist. Because uh, I look at IQ tests, yeah. and I go, I wouldn't under, uh, understand, I don't kind of understand yeah. this based, or, or it's not racist, it's something else. But it feels like it is very much a kind of Western construct and there should be other ways of testing someone's intelligence other than an IQ test you know well yeah you you might be right and I'm not an expert and it's not yeah. just something I've looked at but no what I meant was more you know within races you've got a real spread some people are really smart some people are not uh, genetically yeah you know, that's a huge advantage I mean if you want to talk about privileges you know if you're going Having to talk about privileges race is maybe like that you know the impact maybe is like that compared to you know ge genetic Intelligence. I mean, yeah. so if we are going to talk about privileges, let's just have a scientifically informed conversation about which ones really matter the most, including um, on, on a very broad scale. Uh, yeah, or if you come from a you know an intact family, or you know whatever that it is, all of these things are much more important to your material success, let's say. Uh, but I just think the you know governments can also shape school curriculum a lot more. You know, so there've been times in the past, as as mentioned, in the Canadian case or elsewhere, where the governments can really say, hey, no, you're going to teach about Mao and you're going to teach about the Cultural Revolution and Soviet Gulag and all this sort of stuff alongside the Nazis so that people understand that utopian beliefs um, lead to horrible things the way, same way racist beliefs lead to horrible things. And, and we need to have both. Um, 
And also we need to teach about the pride, you know, good things and pride as well because we've got a country and we need want people to pay tax. Um, you know, yeah, so. and you want, you, want people <laughs> to have, you want people to have a sense of hope and optimism because it yeah. leads to better outcomes. You know, carrots are better than sticks in life and telling your kids that they're all a bunch of racist, nasty little racists who are virus on the planet making the whole thing turn <laughs> right. into a big fiery ball of hell and that they need to be cold and miserable is not a way of furthering a society in any way whatsoever. Um, we are doing this thing via, called bad education at the mm. moment because there's no standardized PSHE curriculum or RSE curriculum in the UK. You alluded to this earlier when you said right. you can't sometimes get um, the, the resources from the school for say what they're teaching in Black History Month or what they teach in PSHE. So our view is that there needs to be a standardized PSHE curriculum at the very least which is not allowed to be Googled by whichever teacher in which uh, in LGBTQ history remembers right. right. And that it's based more around a sense of civic responsibility teaching. Do you know what I mean? What, what I was taught when I was a kid, like if there is an old lady, help her across the road. Not if there is an old white lady, spit at right. her. <laughs> right. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, yeah. It, do you think that would work? I think that's a great idea, um, uh, you know, alongside curriculum transparency so you know having to make your materials and not allowing third-party contractors you know say radical gender or, or race groups in uh, who are aren't willing to have their materials shared because right now they're claiming oh no those are pro proprietary we don't we don't want our competitors to see them so you can't release them that's their argument now so you have to say well if you're not willing to have them released to the public then you can't con we can't contract with you so I think there are a couple of other things that you could do, but yeah, what you, and, and I'd add to what you said, you know, just teaching about what does the law say on speech, you know, that you have speech rights and that they are protected. You know, that uh, in the U.S. there have been studies that uh, kids who've been taught about the First Amendment are much more pro-free speech when they come into university than those who never were taught about the First Amendment. So having to teach kids what what that liberal tradition is in the law is, I think, pretty important as part of the civics uh, curriculum. It's crucial because yeah. without the free expression, they will they don't have a chance in hell. But we're going to have these blossoming uh, graduate groups coming out of universities who, as you say, are getting more and more and more and more intolerant. And they're going to find their way into the institutions, aren't they? Because yeah. they're not going to be finding their way into private business, particularly. I mean, they will. But, yes. then, but much more, they're going to find their employ in the state aren't they? And they're going to change the state from within. Well, we're all going, we don't like this. Right. So, well, they're also changing large corporations. I mean, I yeah, think it's, it's both. Um, so I'm not sure the private sector is a real haven. Maybe small businesses, but... Uh, I mean, in the... We, well, they're killing off small businesses, so you know, oh, all, right. all you need <laughs> okay. to do is take one... I mean, the, the COVID killed it. They did their best to kill off small businesses, and now the latest budget of the autumn statement is even worse for small businesses. Right, okay. There's almost no point in being self-employed, as far as I can gather. Again, caveat, I don't know much about money, but I, <laughs> okay. I just, you know. Yeah. It, but it's, um, it, it's the death of the individual as well, isn't it? The death of, the, uh, of free speech and the death of the individual, and, and the fact that we're going to have to deal with these these. Bastards. Well, this is it. This, it. this idea that people who say, oh, well, it's, it's peak because George Floyd moment is over. I mean, this is so naive because, you know, these younger people, as they become the median voter, right, these are people who believe that if a speaker comes in and a f says something I disagree with, they shouldn't be allowed onto campus. I mean, some of those surveys, uh, you know, in the U.S., for example, if you, you know, something between 70 and 85 percent, if someone comes in and says abortion should be outlawed, you know, I don't believe in abortion, that that person should not be allowed onto campus. Now, you can disagree with that, and I would disagree with that, but they don't seem to be making a distinction between disagreeing with someone's beliefs or even being offended uh, and allowing a person to speak, to have a debate. I mean, that there just seems to be very little space between those two ideas. So I think that needs to be taught to them that this is what the law says, this is our tradition, and right now I don't think it's being taught. Yeah, it's not being taught. And um, why is it not being taught? It's not being taught because, it, again, they are the exact thing that they accuse you of. You know, you talk about the death of the Enlightenment, the death of truth. Mm. They they know the truth exactly what the truth is. The truth is right. you shut up, <laughs> right. isn't it? Yeah, That's well, it's... it's it. if you, you, yeah. You're not allowed and if you, if you on abortion. I mean, classic. The midterms yeah. were classic for this because they knew that all the mail-in ballots were going to come in in the, in the period... Uh, there's no no accident they released the findings of the what the 
Bob's Jobs case or whatever it's called, the Roe versus Wade. Anyway, the thing that oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Roe versus Wade. And then they called it, they're, you know, you, they're, they're going to make abortion illegal. But they didn't make abortion illegal. Yeah. They r returned it to the states, which is, you would have imagined, was more democratic rather than less democratic. But um, everyone got, uh, uh, they're hot under the collar on abortion. It's, um, it's mad. When yeah, I, yeah. I mean, obviously, some states did probably take it too far, and I think. But well, but so I, did some others. Yeah, and so you know, did some you've others. You've got an yeah, equal right. and opposite reaction. If you're yeah. going to have postpartum abortion yeah. in some states, then right. you're going to have some states that are going to have a heartbeat. Right. Bill, right. that's the nature yeah. of the thing. If you're not going to have a, but yeah. my worry is they're going to bring it to Europe, and we're suddenly going to start having conversations about abortion, which we've never had really. In, I mean, they right. had it in Ireland. But in England yeah. and most of Europe has taken a pretty reasonable position mm. on, on abortion, yeah. as far as I, I'm concerned. I don't agree with them. But but, but I think this this point about, I think what it is with free speech and the truth is, is it's not that they don't believe at all in truth and free speech. It's just that those values are secondary to the sacred values. Right. Right. So the sacred values are Kindness. equal outcomes for uh, identity groups plus hypersensitivity to these identities. And that's tops. So if you say something that's true but offends, then you can't say it. Because the top value is you can't offend or you've violated the sacred. Um, and, and so that, that is the value system that they believe in. Um, so they're, they're right when they say, oh, no, I believe in free speech, whatever. But it just goes under the bus. It's like at university. In all of these universities, they have all these grand statements but defending, oh, yes, right to academic freedom, all these sorts of things. But, of course, if academics, researchers say something that activists don't like, those principles are simply subsumed under the kind of care harm kind of cultural socialist principles which dominate because those are the dominant values in the hierarchy that's so upside down though isn't yeah it? because the, you can't you can't work out you can't talk about identity groups and you can't talk about anything else unless you have the free speech that tops that it has to top yeah. that in order to have a reasoned discussion on ethnic disparities or anything else if you can't have two disagreeing voices, it's the same as, again, sorry to drag it back yeah, yeah. to COVID, but there was only one narrative allowed. And look what happened. It was a complete disaster. And yeah. whenever there's only one narrative allowed, it's a complete disaster. So right, that, right. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm sort of, I have a slightly different view on COVID than you do, but I still think it's got to be debated, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. It has to be an open debate. And, yeah. and this idea that this will lead to some great harm, well... You know, we accept a certain level. It's like with a speed limit. We do accept that the speed limit isn't going to be zero miles per hour. There are going to be some people killed, but we accept that as a price to have the freedom and, and, and to drive around at a certain speed. So we have to set that speed at whatever level. But I think the COVID thing is, I, I think this is a, something that's in the past now, and I also think it's not as central to the woke religious belief system because the woke belief system is really about these identity groups as sacred totems that you, you cannot offend even the most sensitive member imaginable of these groups or you've committed a sin. Why do they pick such bad martyrs then? <laughs> well, because I think that, you know, these groups are politically somewhat organized, right? I mean, they're not going to pick people who are, you know, uh, you know, mentally challenged because those people are never going to be an organized political group. <coughs> Whereas... But I, but I mean someone like Jason Blake or, or uh, George Floyd. These are not, right. you know, if, if, you, if you wanted to make a really good martyr for Black Lives Matter, you'd have David Dawn, the mm. guy who was shot in the, defending his shop from right. rioters. You yeah. know, he was a police veteran, so worked in the police force 35 years, was killed protecting his shop. That's a martyr. And if we're talking about immutable skin, immutability, he's a black skinned man and he was killed. He's a martyr. Why are you turning a guy who's... Uh, digitally raped his uh, ex-wife, stolen his kids and has a knife in the car. Why is Joe Biden and Kamala Harris going down to visit this guy? Why are the martyrs so poor? I don't understand. Well, yeah, because it doesn't actually matter the conduct of the individual. It's they're a symbol. Uh, and right. that's what Shelby Steele talks about. He, I mean, he goes back to those early Watts 1960s riots that actually wound up burning down black neighborhoods and impoverishing black neighborhoods and black, you know, ruining black life chances in very large measure. And his argument is, well, actually, these riots are, are very symbolic. They're a performance. And what, so they rarely go into the white, wealthy neighborhoods. In fact, they tend to remain in these black neighborhoods, and they're damaging black businesses. And one of the reasons, according to Steele, is they're trying to win over well, you know, well-off white liberals in these urban areas to actually to their cause. So they're not going to go and attack 
their neighborhoods. I mean, this is one of his points. So yeah, it's very much a kind of engineered spectacle, performance. Um, so it doesn't really matter if the individual is, is no saint. Yeah. Uh, they're useful for the movement. That's a mad. Yeah. And why, and why is every, why is the media on board with it? And why is the government on board with it? And why, when the, when the country are, isn't, as you put it? Why, yeah. why, why, why? Well, I think it's, it's, you know, getting back to Steele's argument that, that the, they're all trying to signal, virtue signal moral authority in this new system where anti-racism is the highest virtue. And now, now the question then that be, it begs is, how did that become the case? Mm. Uh, and I think that involves a kind of shift also in moral authority from right to left. So the left actually, the white left was very keen on the white guilt narrative because it gives not only, it's not that it gave minority people moral authority, it's that it gave the left moral authority. So I think that that's where they are also invested in the white guilt narrative. Um, and so yeah, and then that then spreads and every organization wants to look good on this sort of what Steele would call dissociation, we'd call virtue signaling. They all want to signal how virtuous they are to each other, to the public. Even the police force where, or the military, where yeah. the average rank and file per officer is not interested, but all it takes is this, pu but they don't know the arguments. I mean, those, those average people wouldn't know how to, if someone said, oh, you don't like this anti-racism initiative, you must be a racist, they wouldn't know how to answer back. Well, it doesn't and that's work. Part of the problem. It's, it's not worked in. I mean, there is a peak woke uh, happening in the American military because uh, I mean, I think I can't remember the exact stats, but it's something like uh, work, white working class Americans die in twice the numbers to their demographic in war, right. and now their recruitment is d is down forty five percent because they're tired of being told that they are racist and then being asked to go and die for their country. So it's. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, I, it, <laughs> it's... This stuff is going to have to crumble or get worse. Well, well, I also should say it's got a bunch of down, downstream effects. So even those people who think, oh, culture war is just a little battle on campus somewhere, uh, which it isn't. It's actually the foundations of our civilization. But if you think about these downstream effects, right, so how are we going to have a discussion about crime, about child safeguarding, about homelessness, health, Parents, uh, single parents. You know, all of these issues, immigration, all of these issues you can't really talk about openly, and so you're not going to arrive at the right solution. You can't really help minorities advance because you don't, can't diagnose what's leading them not to advance, right? So that, all of these things are actually affected by this f narrowing of the Overton window caused by the rise of wokery. So it's not just something that, um, you know, elites like to talk about. This has actually got a lot of real world effect. And then we could talk about China and Russia and all these countries that exploit this division in the West, which has been caused by, uh, by the advance of cultural socialism. And, and so they're exploiting those divisions, um, which is actually helping, you know, it's keeping the Democrats in these countries from, from having a winning hand, because they'll say, oh, you want to bring trans into Russia or into China. You know, you're an idiot. Well, it, it's a tough argument to make. Well, the Chinese also send 400,000 of their students into Confucius Institutes every year, don't they, in, in the U.S. universities. So it's, um, they, they've, they've been watching us very carefully and where our weak points are. Is right. it, 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 has China taken over the, the, as the world's most powerful superpower? <laughs> um, no, well, I, I think they've got a certain amount of power. I mean, I'm not... Culturally. Culturally, I don't think so. I mean, it's, it's, so they are exploiting Western weakness to prevent reform at home uh, and to shoot down, you know, liberal democracy. But I think that in terms of their power, culturally, I think it's limited because they're not an expansionist power the same way the Soviet Union were. I mean, they're content to be Chinese in China mm. rather than make us all into Chinese. I mean, despite the Confucius Institutes. So I don't think they're actually going to have the soft power, you know, basically a very few friends in their own region, most of the other countries hate them. I don't think they have a lot of soft cultural power, no, but no. certainly they have military power, yeah. And um, what about your, your Canadian, what about yeah. uh, Trudeau? Come on. Yeah, I think Canada's sort of in the worst place of, of any of the countries in, in many ways because there's, there's very little resistance to this woke juggernaut. So you may be aware of something called the residential schools in Canada, which is all about this, this claim that there were these mass graves uh, found at a, at a sort of 
school in Western Canada. That led to, you know, 40 Catholic churches being burned, statues being toppled, and Trudeau lowering the Canadian flag to half-mast. Now, the reality is there was not a single body found. There were no mass graves. Not only that, I mean, this whole narrative about genocide is a complete fraud. I mean, if you actually dig into the evidence of people, I mean, these, these residential schools were, you know, they were not a good idea, but actually most native kids did not attend them, number one. There were no native kids torn from their parents and made to attend them, number I mean, all of these things, I mean, if we are going to have a, a conversation about truth and evidence, all of that's been brushed under the carpet by the media, the Trudeau government, and they've just Feelings. run with this thing because it's useful. Again, it's this moral authority that they can attach themselves to, and it's kind of a moral authority of the left against the right, so it's very useful. And um, it's, it's yeah. a moral authority. I suppose in the olden days, this stuff was kept in check by religion. Um, yeah. because the moral authority was with God and you were the sinner and you had to spend your life trying to be like, you know, live like Jesus lived and right. you know, all of those sorts of things. So that's kind of gone. We killed God now. So we've replaced it with a, with a sort of illusion of what that, those values meant, which is this, you know, totally prioritizing all of these things that don't do any good at all. So we're not, we're not loving thy neighbor. I yeah, yeah, I mean, that is interesting. I mean, I think it's interesting. It is very religious, this idea that yeah. the, the, these are sacred symbols. So African Americans or Native Canadians are, are somehow sacred and cannot be criticized. Um, that is part of the. I think there is this desire to venerate and to have rituals and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, but now, whether it's. I don't, I'm not sure it's caused by the necessarily by the decline of religion, which has been at a weak point in, in quite a few societies like Britain for quite some time. Uh, but, but there is a, a certain vacuum there that can be filled, absolutely. With this sort of yeah, moral yeah. supremacy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so where can people read the report? It's all online. Um, if you just Google policy exchange uh, culture wars, you'll probably find it. Or policy exchange in my name, you'll find it. Um, and so, yeah, so those, I mean, I'm, I'm intending to, to get this into a book form, but uh, not just these reports, but, but just to have this talk about cultural socialism, because I think it needs a name. Um, part of the problem is you've got like five different, six different names for this thing. Yeah, um, uh, even woke is getting a bit difficult yeah. to understand, because I'm starting to notice that sort of right-leaning libertarians are also quite woke in a right-wing way, which I find. Oh, okay. Oh, really? Which I find kind of spooky as well. Oh, okay. Um, but that's, that's <laughs> for another day. Yeah. And you're on social media? Yep, on Twitter. Um, What's your handle? It's at E-P-K-A-U-F-M. There you go. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, it's been great, Lawrence. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you for coming in. All right. Thanks for having See me. See you guys.